of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning my goal is that you as the hearers would have an increasing attitude of spiritual humility before God. Some of you probably know about this, uh, probably because I've bragged about it from time to time. <laughs> But uh, when I was in seminary, my intention was to become a United States Army chaplain. And uh, things didn't pan out that way. I'm very glad and thankful to be a parish pastor and love what I do. But in that time, I actually carried a commission as a lieutenant in the United States Army. And I trained. I went to United States Chaplain School. And I also had the opportunity to go to the Airborne School as well to become a paratrooper. And in fact, I did earn my airborne wings. You were looking at a bona fide paratrooper here before you. <laughs> and when we were there, there was a photographer who took a, true, uh, took, a uh, took a picture of our class. And as we were going and ordering our pictures and so on, uh, he relayed a story about how when he himself went through airborne school, and he talked about how after the first week at Airborne School, he went out on the town there in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and entertained himself the way many young soldiers <coughs> fortunately do. Well, the next morning he woke up. And almost just like a movie, he felt a stinging sensation on his left arm, and he looked over, and there was a tattoo. He had no memory of getting a tattoo. And this was probably the worst kind of tattoo you could possibly have if you were in airborne school and had it not graduated yet. Paratrooper wings. You're not supposed to have that until after you finish. Well, he was okay as long as his overshirt was on, but when he had to take that off, all of a sudden, the airborne sergeant saw that tattoo. This is not good. So they said, soldier, you shouldn't have that. And so they took duct tape, and on a fresh tattoo, put duct tape over it to cover it up. And so then he'd go along, and another sergeant would say, Soldier, you're out of uniform. Why do you have duct tape on your arm? And rip it off. And they say, Oh, well, now I see why you have that on there. And put the duct tape back on. And then rip it off and put it back on, and you get the idea. It went on that way for another two weeks. They gave him all sorts of other kinds of trouble. Sometimes when he would go off the towers, they would only put <coughs> half of his harnesses on so he'd be sideways. And he said he even lost a couple of teeth in the process. This is good image for us. Because we should never act as if we have arrived when we are in the process of arriving. We should never think of ourselves as more than we actually are. Certainly when we are at airborne school, but even more <coughs> when it comes to our spiritual lives. You see, because we always have this temptation. We always have this temptation to believe that our knowledge of Christ and of the Christian faith is greater than it actually is. And here we see this temptation playing out in the Gospel of John. Jesus Christ says this, In that day you will ask nothing of me, truly, truly I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until, you have, until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive it, your joy may be full. Then he says this, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming. When I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Now we read a few sentences later, and we read this. Yay. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly, and not using figures of speech. 
Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Now, the Gospel of John doesn't record exactly what Jesus did, but I like to think of Jesus doing something like this, hitting his head against the table in despair, or perhaps hitting himself up against the forehead because the disciples were utterly not getting it and completely were not listening to what he said. Jesus said, in the future, in the hour that is coming, I will stop using figures of speech and will speak plainly to you. But here, they say, oh, you're speaking plainly to us now and not using figures of speech now. And throughout the disciples' words, there's this air of an idea that they believe that they know now what is in fact being revealed to them in the future. In fact, they say this. Now we know. It's as if they think that they've arrived to the fullness of what Jesus has to offer. Jesus says, there's more you need to know. I will teach you these things, but there is more. And instead the disciples say, ah, oh, you told to us all already, and we know. They fell prey to this temptation to believe that they knew what they didn't. This temptation to see themselves as having arrived to the fullness of the knowledge of God, rather than being in the process of arriving to the knowledge of God. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe that this is a temptation that very often you and I fall prey to, very frequently in our own spiritual lives. Now, perhaps this first example of a symptom whereby we uh, sometimes give in to this temptation is maybe not the most appropriate for this group. I mean, this is a rainy day, and it's the day after Derby Day. If anybody is here in the sanctuary today, it's probably because you're pretty committed to going to church. But, nonetheless, how often do even the most committed of us find ourselves thinking, I really have to go to church this Sunday? Or what am I really getting out of this app? I think a lot of us, probably all of us from time to time, think that. This is a symptom of this attitude. That we believe that we have arrived at the fullness of what we need from God. Rather than an attitude of believing that we have more, infinitely more, to learn. Not reading the scriptures is another symptom of this attitude. Sometimes, I would guess if you were like me, sometimes you go through great periods where each day you're opening the scriptures, exploring what God has to say to us. But if you're also like me, there are probably times where you're not as fervent reading scriptures, where the Bible remains closed rather than open on a day-to-day -day basis. This too is a symptom of thinking that there's really no more that we need. We, we know all that God has to show us. When we do not pray is another example of that. What are we saying when we do not pray? And again, I imagine that for most of us, our, our prayer lives are in fits and starts. We maybe are go through a month or two months of, of praying daily, frequently, every day. But then, if you're like me again, perhaps there are periods where your prayer life becomes a little bit more cold, a little bit less frequent. And what are we saying when we do not pray? We're saying that we do not expect anything from the hand of God. 
We are saying that we have all that we can expect from Him. This is another symptom of this attitude that we have arrived rather than this attitude that we are in the process of arriving. This attitude that we have all that we need. Despising preaching is another example of this. I'm embarrassed to tell you about one Christmas Eve I was at my parents' church and after the service, I sat down with my brothers and sisters and we started talking about the sermon and we started picking it apart and criticizing it. And my granny, who was not one to mince words at all, said, this is not what God wants you to be doing right now. And she was right. How often are we like? How often are we, on the one hand, so willing to sit through hours of reality television where it's hour after hour of people gawking at people getting on scales and getting weighed in, like I'm the biggest loser, or, or whatever the case may be, inane, mind-melting stuff, where we begin to fidget, get uncomfortable when a sermon begins to last a little bit more than 15 or 20 minutes. This too is a symptom of this attitude that I'm talking about. Where we do not have this desire to learn more and more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a real danger in this attitude. A very real danger. You see, when our hands are not open to the gifts that God wants to give us, our hands become closed. And when our hands are closed, what do we make? Fists. If our hands are not open to God, we run the risk of becoming enemies against God. And we run the risk of rejecting the most basic promises and blessings that God wants to give us. St. Paul said this. If anyone thinks that he stands, take heed, lest he fall. <coughs> I think St. Paul was talking about, yes, indeed, um, be careful in your war against temptation and sin. Don't think that you are impenetrable against the assaults of the devil. But I think that St. Paul was also getting to this. Beware. Don't think that you are in a place of power and knowledge that you no longer need anything from God. Because here is the reality of that attitude. It is one step away, in fact, perhaps it is nearly the other side of the coin of unbelief, of lack of faith. <coughs> and so wherever we have this attitude, we must beware. But on the other hand, what are the benefits of having open hands towards God? What are the benefits of always believing ourselves to be in the process of becoming rather than seeing ourselves as being the fullness of what God has in store for us? First of all, wisdom. Solomon said this, the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Why? You see, the Word of God, the incarnate Son of God, is the one through whom the world was made. For God used His Word to create. The eternal Word of God, the Son of God, is the one through whom the world is ordered, through whom it continues to be held together, and in whom it will be restored in the time to come. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you seek to be wise, 
and wise not merely with the kind of practical wisdom of, that the world offers, but wise unto eternity. Wise to the real reality of the world. The underlying spiritual dimension that is interwoven into the very reality in which we live and breathe. Then we must have our hands open to the word of God, to Christ, to the scriptures, to prayer. And with this wisdom comes several things. First of all, with this wisdom comes peace. You see, we who have wisdom from God, who are open to the instruction of God, know that as Christ says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And so therefore, you and I as Christians have hope and peace where the unbeliever has no cause for anything but despair. I mean, think about the world in which we live. Yes, indeed, we live in a world in which we have made incredible, uh, we have made incredible progress in the realm of science and technology. We have made incredible progress when it comes to such things as biology and physics. But think about how we use this kind of knowledge. Yes, we can use these things to build great cities. Yes, we can use these things to gain knowledge. Yes, we can use these things to gain wealth. Yes, we can use these things to heal. But yet we also use the knowledge of physics to blow up crowds in Boston. We also use the knowledge of biology to create ricin and anthrax. We create the wisdom and the ways of business in order not only to do good things with our businesses, but also to put down others and to exploit others. Brothers and sisters in Christ, from a merely worldly perspective, we have no hope. Because even the progress that the world makes is yet used unto evil ends. It's a great But as Christians, we see this. Christ says, I overcome. So we have hope. We have hope that the evil of this world will be tread down under the feet of Christ. We have hope that sin and sinfulness and evil will melt away. We have hope of eternal joy and blessedness and peace and unity and pleasure at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We have this hope because of our wisdom. We have this hope because of our knowledge. Is there a great benefit and to having open hands to God, yes, there is. <laughs> there is wisdom for this day, but also wisdom for the day that is to come. And there is joy as well. Incredible joy. We see in such things as uh, the pleasures that we have in life as not being random, not being just you know, pointless specks of pleasure in an otherwise cold and lifeless and soulless world, but we see these things as the act of a loving and caring and joyful God. And we look at our own hearts and our own souls. And we look at the sin, the guilt and the shame that attach to that. And we know that it is a tone for we know that it is put under the feet of Christ. We know that it has been buried into the tomb of Christ and has not come back. But rather we are free. Free from sin. Free from shame. Free from guilt. And that is joyous. We might turn our backs on guilt, but we can never seem to get away from it. We might try to convince ourselves that morality and, 
and things like virtue are just false ideas of previous times. But guilt and shame remain powerful, powerful forces in the world. But for the Christian, because we have the knowledge of forgiveness of the blood of Christ. I'd like to leave you with uh, a couple of thoughts about how this applies to our, our daily lives and how we can live out this attitude of spiritual humility. First of all, I think as is obvious from earlier in, this, in the sermon, if we have an attitude of spiritual humility before God, we are going to joyfully read the scriptures. We are going to pray. We are going to attend church, listen to sermons, receive the sacraments gladly. What if you might say to yourself, I don't quite feel like doing that. I think CFW Walther has a great example as to uh, how these things can impact us. C.F.W. Walther was one of the founding fathers of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And one day, a young seminarian came into his office and said, uh, Pastor Walther, I'm having a hard time believing the Christian faith. And Walther said this, say the creed. And as a young seminarian said, well, that's just the problem. I'm having a tough time believing that Jesus Christ is indeed the incarnate Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was resurrected. And Walter said, I understand that. Say, read. If you want to have an attitude of spiritual humility, which I do indeed hope you all want that, and engage in these practices. <coughs> Read the scriptures. Pray. Hear your sermons. God will bless you through these things. And God will do his work of humbling you through these things. Second, I, I really hope that you hold the cross at the center of your lives. You see, Jesus Christ said this. He said, the hour is coming when I will show you all things and I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about that Father. And it's very clear from the context that Jesus is talking about the time to come. The time when he will come back out of heaven and power and glory and might. The second coming. But here's the thing. He sort of goes from talking about his return in power and glory to talking about the cross. He says this, Behold the hour, he uses the same language, Behold the hour is coming, and indeed it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. And then he goes to talk about the Father. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. This is hard to understand. In fact, I myself do not understand it fully. I, I do not comprehend it. But in the cross, we see eternity. In the cross, the second coming of Christ came upon earth. In the cross, the revelation that will be given to us in eternity, when we will see the Father clearly, and when we will dwell in the beauty of the Holy Trinity has been revealed. If you want to have the blessings that God wants to give you, look to the cross. For there we see the fullness until Christ comes again of what he wants to reveal to us. And, and finally, I'd like to give you this image. I am a father of three young children, and I work a lot with uh, children. I uh, do the preschool chapels here throughout the week. I, I teach confirmation, a little bit older kids. And Christ told us that we should have faith like children. 
Usually people interpret that to mean that we should have a dumb, unquestioning faith. I actually don't think that's what Jesus was talking about, because children, if they do anything, ask tons of questions. Why? Tell me about this. Why does that work? Why, 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 why? The children are sponges. We all know this. They absorb everything. Sometimes if we are blessed, they absorb those things we want them to know. All too often they absorb the things that they see from this rather not. But the fact is, they are ready to learn. I think this is because they come from this attitude of humility. They look at the world around them. And I, and I remember when I was a young child and, and how mysterious the world was. <clears throat> Looking at the moon as I was traveling down the interstate and wondering, why in the world does the moon follow our car? <laughs> Looking at the snow falling out of the sky and being mesmerized by its beauty. <laughs> Sitting in church, certainly not understanding a whole lot. I mean, words like redemption and propitiation and forgiveness and trinity. Symbols that were hard for me to understand, like the pastor's robes and um, Greek letters up above the altar and stained glass and all sorts of weird figures like bulls with wings. And I didn't understand any of this. <coughs> but yet I had a desire to learn. And I think it is this sense of mystery of being mesmerized by this incredible world, this incredible revelation that the Lord has given us in the scriptures. That I think Christ was really coming to and really getting. My encouragement is for you to try to become like children in this way. Uh, today is confirmation. And we have the great and wondrous opportunity to hear Two young men confess their Christian faith. This is a powerful thing. They're saying that they would rather die than stop believing Jesus. They're saying that the thing they hold most dearly is their faith in the Christ our Lord. And they have done marvelously in learning over the past two years that I've been working with. I was so proud, and two weeks ago we had their examination publicly. They did incredibly. But here's my encouragement to you guys. Confirmation is not graduation. Confirmation is merely a beginning. In the same way that you have used your efforts and your mind power to learning about Christ our Lord, continue through this throughout your whole life. This is my encouragement to you all as well. To be like little children and learn. Don't be like a paratrooper student. Don't get that tattoo that says, I've arrived. But know, brothers and sisters in Christ, be home. And always look for what Christ has to tell you. In the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.